Usually with noirs, there's a staple action that usually happens is that some kind of an events a guy just slaps a girl. And I love that because we're doing a kind of a, and I'll get in the increments of why I call this a post neo noir. I love the whole catalyst is Bill Pullman slaps her. <laughs> and that starts the whole noir series with this movie. Hi, everybody. I'm Nick from the St. Paul Filmcast. And I'm Kyle from GoFromReviews.com. We're going to talk about the slap that kicked off the satire noir? I don't know. Yeah. We'll have to talk about what genre this really falls into yeah. in The Last Seduction. Welcome back to the show. I'm one of your hosts, Kyle Gothi from GoFromReviews.com. Hi everybody, I'm Nick from the St. Paul Filmcast. Thanks for finding us, thanks for watching, and for our loyal fans, thank you for continuing to support the show. You can follow the show on Twitter and on Instagram. We do have a Patreon. Check that out for a great deal to tell us what to do. Both Kyle and I are members of the Minnesota Film Critics Alliance. Check out that webpage for other critics' reviews as well as ours. And today we're going to talk about the staple of noirs in the 90s. It is Last Seduction. When Bridget Gregory's husband, Clay, successfully sells a boatload of medicinal cocaine, she <laughs> takes off with the money, leaves New York, and hides out in the small town of Beston. Now she's avoiding Clay and shacking up with the naive local Mike in order to escape her understandably furious husband's wrath. Okay, so, so this is the director, John Dahl, who primarily worked in neo-noirs, and I'm going to get into a little bit later why I consider this a post-neo-noir. <laughs> Uh, he did in 1989, Kill Me Again, uh, Red Rock West with Nick mm. Cage, uh, Kill Me Again is with Al Kilmer. He will go on after this, we'll do, do Unforgettable, Rounders, Joyride, which is kind I of a sleeper like horror movie. Yeah. 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 Um, you good. Kill Me with Brad Pitt. He's also dabbled into directing a lot of TV, so a lot of episodes of Dexter, Ray Donovan, of course, yep. since he's doing noir, Justified in The Walking Dead, as well as the cinematographer, I believe, has done uh, a few of TV and film also. Mm -hmm. Why I wanted to say that right then is because there's a little bit of elements. This looks like a made-for-TV movie at times. Well, there's an interesting thing behind that, actually. This film had a lot of controversy for Linda Fiorentino's role in it, yeah. purely because she was so beloved by critics in this role that they oh, wanted I, to yeah. get her up for an Oscar. Yeah. Well, the problem was the film... Uh, the film's producers decided to premiere the film on HBO before running it through a theatrical release. Yes. Which made the film ineligible for Oscars. So she was not able to be nominated for her role in this film. Nowadays, they don't give a things, crap. Well, that's one of the things now is nowadays with, with what the pandemic has done to us. We recently saw with a film, uh, I think it was Good Luck to You, Leo Grand, on Hulu film that had to appeal to the Academy to try and get eligible for the awards. And it was successful. So Academy's been a little bit looser about these kind of confines now that now with the age of streaming. But it's too bad this film was overlooked in that way because it is a powerhouse performance. I don't. It's it, at the core of the center is the femme fatale Bridget, mm -hmm. um, who has masterful skills not only as selling and selling just constantly not only herself mm -hmm. but gimmicks that do not work. Yeah. But she has a remarkable skill of writing backwards very eloquently, and yeah. she actually does it in the movie. She really does it in the movie. I wonder if almost that was her thing. Because yeah. it sounds like Fiorentino was very involved in what her in like her character's evolution from yeah. page to screen. Uh, she crafted one of the iconic sex scenes in the film <laughs> because they were walking by the fence and she just said, Here, grab a camera. You stand over there. I'm gonna go over and do this. Like oh, and she crafted Berg? that yeah, that first scene in the film and he said it was really he goes Peter Berg said afterwards, he was like, Well, of course it was a fun scene to shoot. Um, but it was also a uh, it was also really cool to see someone so invested in how their character was going to be portrayed that she was kind of stealing the director's energy to use it on herself. Authentic, because as she's the lead star, she's on mm. the cover, she's right there smoking. <laughs> but you have, I think, at the core, and I, I'm, overall, I'm going to say the, the writing for this is great, but understand, it's the character. Yeah. It's her. It's the, She's in the middle of the spider web, and everybody knows it's not good to be around her, but mm -hmm. they still have to. They deal with her. Yeah. You have to. It was almost like a magnetism of just... And then and the fact she tells him, you know, fuck off. Just yeah. go away. Which even more... Like, yeah, it's, yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. almost like a, a lesson in attraction makes us all stupider. Because <laughs> Peter Berg is attracted to her and, he's and, like, and he better. makes mistakes knowing that he shouldn't. She also kind of does the same thing, though, too, where she chooses to begin kind of a, a sexual relationship with this guy knowing that she doesn't really have a plan for this yet and she is hiding out with a bunch of money. Yeah. Same thing comes with Bill Pullman. He is he has to be smarter than his character than his character is portrayed in this film. There is no way that this guy is that stupid after after all the events in the film. But yet he makes these stupid decisions out of attraction. 
It's yeah. all a bunch of characters who are good looking and stabbing each other in the back. <laughs> so if you know, this is why I pre yeah they're pointing it out. Thank mm -hmm. you. But that's wonderful. All the troops, we've, all the tropes we've seen in noirs. Found fatal. They're not good for you. She's going to be deadly. She's manipulating everybody. Guys are just stupid. They think with one brain or oh, half a brain, and you, you pretty much everybody's going to be condemned. Yep. And she's going to come out just you morons, mm -hmm. which is always a testament. The barometer for always noirs is: Are you really smart? Or are you really dumb? Yeah. <laughs> when you have to make the snap decisions, which ones do you make? Because everyone is great with a plan but it's how you act when that plan turns to sh you know <laughs> like when it plans goes nowhere how do you respond and that decides who lives and who dies in these kinds of stories in fact you can see her entire manipulation even then when she has outburst get out and she shuts the door she's like that was so much fun yeah right yeah, yeah there's kind of a she gets joy out of out of taking advantage of people she does <laughs> like i think she likes that more than more than the slap i think she was always going to leave clay and take the money it's just a question of it was the catalyst. Yeah, what yeah. was going to finally cause it? Was she going? And then to she oversells it. Oh, he beat me. <laughs> yeah, and she kind of she's she's perfectly fine being able to ride the line between a truth teller and a naysayer because she she very like she chooses her lies well. She tells the truth when she has to. I mean, there's that whole part where she's sitting at the table in the bar and he come, Mike comes over and asks her, and she kind of tells him everything that happened, but it's so absurd that he doesn't believe it. And she's comfortable telling, being able to give out that information, knowing that it wouldn't make it anywhere. Another effective thing I like about the movie is the music. It's jazz, sax, and drums, but it has a sense of aimless exercise, skipping. It's almost like a fun. Mm. It's almost like you're just kind of like waking up in the morning like, yay. And I think that's kind of almost a projection of her mind. This is fun, just manipulating people to hell. Yeah. <laughs> she's enjoying herself. And I think that's that the music goes back to what John Dahl was trying to do. He had, had said in an interview that he was aiming to make a dark comedy. He was not trying to make a noirist film. Nothing about the film that really spoke to him in a, in a noir way. He was trying to make a satirical dark comedy. And I can see that in the music. The music is having fun. The music is, is and yep. so is Bridget. Bridget is having fun. It's almost like he didn't aim for that area, but he ended up with it regardless. We always talk about when we make movies that movies sometimes have a life of their own and you just can't fight it. It's mm -hmm. like, this is the what's going to happen. All right, we'll just go with it. Yeah. yeah, and that's why I'm such a proponent of rarely ever does an author or a writer actually mean half the things people interpret from their work. You know, I went to school for English, so like it was always like, what was the intention of this symbol, this item here? And I was like, oftentimes, the duck is a duck. And, and you just, you're seeing something into it that it's not, it's about what we gleam out of it. And so that's, yeah, the film becomes its own thing, and then it's what we gleam out of it that yep. affects us as viewers. So, another trope is Venetian blinds. And I love that <laughs> the entire office is just filled with Venetian blinds, and she knows how to, all right, it's time to go dark, and she does, mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm going to be in my secret. But also, she plays in the noirs as setting up the mood as well in the movie. Yeah. So, of course, you're going to have Venetian blinds in the office for a, a noir movie. Yeah, if I had to work in that office, God, no lighting at all, man. Like, <laughs> I, just, I was watching it just feeling like I was getting a headache from it. But it looks like a lot of rented spaces, like the house is very empty, so it looks like a lot of maybe home for sales and you just use the space, the home for sale, or the office space was kind of empty. You know, empty. Part of what I thought about that was Beston is a small town, and I thought, you know, I came from a small town of a couple thousand people, and part of what I saw in that small town was people, everyone talking about leaving, but so many of them coming back. And I think when you come back to your small town, whether you're mo moving back in with your parents, whether you're moving there just to kind of get a fresh start, or even whether your intention is to leave and you're always intending to leave, small towns are a web and they catch you. And so these people all moved in like, I'm just going to stay in Beston for a couple weeks. That person's lived there for 10 years now. Yeah, You know, I think that's what Beston is, is it's a place that catches people and brings them in. And I think that's why it's got that kind of rented out quality. It also could be because it, it was a low budget film and they had to do with what they could, but it comes out kind of feeling like a web film, you know? Yeah, I like that element that she's, she's a, almost a fish out of water because that works with your contrast for your script. Well, here's a very city femme fatale from New York City, stylist, upset, just mm. bull. She's a bully in the beginning with her market <laughs> sales people that call up yeah. to sell things. And she's a, she's a bully, but you take her out of a small town and you see how much she really is by contrasting small town. People are nice to her and she hates it. Hello, mm -hmm. good morning. 
Yeah, yeah. she's just sickened by that. Yeah. <laughs> kids walk by like, oh my god, don't contaminate me with your kid stuff. You You're know. touching me. <laughs> <laughs> right. So you, you establish a character, basically take them out of their environment mm. with the contrast. Yeah, that and her, sense. you know, she she actually looks and acts like she's not out of town. Which, mm. When she, Mike, when Peter Berg's character, are you new here? Well, how do you know? <laughs> yeah, you dumb. Idiot. What gave it away in this town of like eighty people that I'm yeah. not one of those? 80 and she people. orders a Manhattan, and even the bartender is like, I, I don't. You can tell, like, I don't know how to make that. You yeah. Know? yeah. He's like looking through his beer brands, like Manhattan beer. No. Yeah. Um, yeah, it is kind of an inverse, and again, that goes back to. Uh, maybe what I could call the film accidentally noir uh, because it wasn't intended to be. Um, it's funny yeah, that you look at the... Even with the Venetian blinds, it doesn't look like it was intentional. But Yeah, just the, the more he brings up that it was a, it planned as a dark comedy, I just kind of have a giggle because so many elements of it are like, yeah, you accidentally made a noir, didn't you? Um, it, it feels, yeah, that inverse of like so many hopeful films of like the, the young small town girl gets to the big city and she's going to realize her dreams. And this is that inverse of like the hardened person who's lived in the city too long gets to the small town and realizes like I hate people. <laughs> so I hate people, but she's bored not manipulating them. Yeah, she she likes being that's the chess favorite, player. You know, that's her favorite activity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like talking about what? Who cares? But then yeah. she realizes that maybe she can get some information off of them. Yeah, and then she pretends like oh, I'm really interested. Yeah, but uh, that kind of goes back to again like. A guy like how how men are often portrayed as, you know, characters who don't really care what the girl's saying as long as they can get some. And it's nice to see the inverse as well as like she's not yeah, interested yeah. in she's him other than as an object. Yeah. Um, and and she will make foolish decisions because of that primal need. So it is again. There's a lot of inverses to the film that feel like they're fair inverses that they're not trying to chide one side or the other. They're not trying to make these like bridges between gender, but they're trying to say that we all are essentially the same beast <laughs> you know so uh there's a lot of no you know another thing of noirs is private detectives are in this movie mm -hmm. they're not really effective private detectives <laughs> non-effective detectives no <laughs> bill nunn who kind of it's kind of set kind of deflating because bill nunn is such a wonderful actor to see in movies mm -hmm. and his character is just so he can't help himself yeah yeah well, I like that about, you know, Bill Nunn is an actor. You know, the scene, uh, you know, um, before you get in, that scene with her and him in the car, it's shot really well. Yeah. I mean, it's probably And perfect. car scenes are, are tough. Yeah. Car scenes are very tough to shoot um, and make them cinematic because it's two people that can't move. Yeah. Um, Bill Nunn is the kind of character actor that, you know, even if you don't recognize the name when we say it, you know the image when you see him. He's a guy who is like a great spice to a film because even yeah. if the film is, even if the character role is small, he adds something to it. He is very funny in his, what, combined 10 minutes of screen time in all three of the Sam Raimi Spider-Man films. You know, he's he's able to add yeah, a little bit minutes, to just yeah. his few minutes of screen time. And I don't think he ever looks at it as big role or small role because, again, when he's in a lot of movies where he's a big role and he's in a lot of movies where he's just the, the added spice. And it's, it's nice to have actors that can add something to a role with limited screen time and that it doesn't feel like wasted space, which is good. All right, so before he was president that an Air Force pilot, Bill Pullman, was in this movie. Mm -hmm. And you wonder, how can this guy be a, <laughs> the president that leaves the charge? He learned from his uh, half-man, half-dog. But he's kind of, <laughs> I wouldn't say he's not emasculated kind of a man, but he's just, he's not as masculine and clever and smart as he thinks he is. He thinks he is the stereotypical male figure, yeah. you know? Uh, and that's how he sees himself in the mirror even. You can you can see that kind of presence of how he tries to portray himself. But then on the outside, he's a slimy rat. Right, um, drug dealer. Yeah. yeah. You know, he's he's a doctor who's willing to sell medicinal cocaine. Uh, and then I love, I actually really why love the, the hell, scene. If you're a drug dealer, why would you take out a loan from a loan shark? <laughs> <laughs> but again, it's it's a mismanaging of money. It's going yeah. to a drug deal without any plan of attack so that when he gets duped by them, he's just like, oh, come on. Like, yeah. what a great introduction to his character. Oh, God, dude, um, you know, we were going to be friends and they pulled a gun at me. Maybe yeah. my most disappointed part about his character is that I wanted more of him in the movie because I just love Bill Pullman. That he's kind of a... He's kind of a presence throughout, but not a physical presence. Oh, when he said he's going to run down to the payphone? Yeah. And then he's, he's in the living room. <laughs> Opens the window, and he's like... <laughs> <laughs> um, That's a great 
scene to have in the movie, but it's still, I understand why the big character did it. Too. Yeah. yeah. I wish that there was more of him in this movie because I found his interaction with Bridget more interesting to me than Mike's interaction with Bridget. So I wanted more of the Bill Pullman to it. Again, that's me critiquing the film I want instead of the film we got. But um, Bill Pullman, I think, like, for what screen time he's given is a unique Bill Pullman performance because usually he's, he's portrayed usually as a pretty standard, you know, guy's guy like a standard you know yeah. standard issue guy but uh this is kind of an inverse he's not tough at all but he thinks he is <laughs> right it's a little bit space y yeah but at least that character has some kind of a talent to and, he, it. and he's lovable enough yeah. <laughs> in space balls but he has the you know the gags mm -hmm. yes um if you watch carefully you'll notice jt walsh in it um mm -hmm. john Dahl and him have worked on previous i think tv shows and stuff like that and you'll notice J.T. Walsh doesn't have a lot to do in this movie. He's pretty much just answering the phone. But um, another one of those interesting character actors in this movie. Yeah. J.T. Walsh, I actually just watched, uh, I, I just started watching in a uh, backdraft last night when I was going to bed, and I forgot J.T. Walsh is in that I film. Forgot he, yeah. um, I, I really love J.T. Walsh in Needful Things, the Stephen King adaptation. He plays one of the best douche humans ever in that film. Yeah. Um, J.T. Walsh, again, Kind of like a spice. He kind of adds a little bit when he's in a film. I don't know of any movies where he's a lead or even close to a lead. No, he's even in the always movie, The Grifters, is, he's just part of a backstory. Yeah, he's always there just to kind of add something to it. And it's too bad because, again, like, he, he brings a lot to play in the film. I really like him as this lawyer character who's kind of on her side but at an arm's length. Where he's like, she could screw me over too. Yeah. I'll give her just solve enough your to own keep problems. Yeah. Yeah. I'm over here. Solve your own problems. Great yeah. characters. Great characters. That's why I like great characters, even though we don't really necessarily care what's going to happen to them, but we understand their entire motivations throughout the program. Yeah. And in fact, when Mike's character, Peter Berg, who actually is a director himself and a writer himself, mm -hmm. um, there's a point where he gets the upper hand and he tells her off. Yeah. And then she's like, oh, God, he really got me. Yeah. yeah. And then she kind of sees him as almost an equal for for a little bit of for time. For a little bit, right. You know, she's yeah. like, maybe he's not as stupid as I thought he was. And it kind of changes the way her character approaches him for the rest of the film. Yeah. Because again, like she will continue though. manipulating him, no yeah. doubt. But she knows now he's not as dumb as I thought. But still, I can make this work. <laughs> but like you said, you have to flush out your characters to me saying human. And that's mm -hmm. the balance force that he actually can balance between her. He's constantly not subordinate to her. Yeah. But he actually can compete a little bit. So you need to, you know, like the beginning, even with Bill Nunn, there's certain where, all right, now it broke. Now he's mm. completely in her web. And yeah. He's done for. And I, yeah. I, I like the slow dismantling of, I, we're going back to Bill Nunn. That's but a good, I want to say the slow dismantling I love of that. Bill yeah. Nunn. When he shows up, we're like, oh, she is screwed. And then the scene plays for 60 seconds, and you're like, maybe she's not screwed. And then 60 seconds pass, and you're like, is he falling for it? Another minute goes by, oh, you idiot. Like, it's right, just, yeah. Yeah, watching it kind of crumble. Um, just it, like you in know, uh, the conversation, Gene Hackman's character falls for the oldest trick in the book. Yeah, going yeah. back to that, and like, he knew he was, over the course of that scene, we're like, you're going to make a mistake here. You're and he, do and it. he knew it, and he did it anyways, yeah. Yeah, there's a spider caught in the web element to, to both of those films and both the, the characters. But overall... If you want to do noir writing, I think this is effective. I don't think this is not the aim what they wanted, but you understand your characters. There's vulnerabilities as well as strengths. She has multiple talents, but at the core, you're constantly thinking, you know, she. I think in, she's in every scene. I think mm -hmm. if I watch it three times, she's in every scene, whether you talk about her or not. But you I'll flush out the other supporting characters. I, understand, I feel Bill Nunn's character does exist. He's a real human being. So yeah. I like the overall the writing of it as well as the interactions of it. Not to mention, I get the sense of the tone. Oh, my God. There was a black guy came here to see you. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> that's, that's Jeez, a, the racist, that scene was so like, The office is so... <laughs> oh. Did you tell her about the black guy? That's why I really hope I somebody somebody on online was trying to find out if Beston was a real town, and I was like, I hope not, because they portrayed that town as a bunch of small town racists. <laughs> I just couldn't get over that racists that don't um, know and they're not in the full they radar. Don't see it that they don't way, see it that way, right? right yeah. We just don't know any black people, you know. You know? And there was a black man that came to see you. Are you in trouble? Yeah. <laughs> my goodness. Oh man. Yeah. yeah I. Uh, <laughs> this movie goes back to my my conceit though that but I do that, think it's. it's it's funny to watch now. Yeah. I think it's intentionally funny. It's not uncomfortable racism. It's it's uncomfortable in the sense that, like, you think... <laughs> you, you think to yourself, I hope I didn't say that in the 90s. Like, you think, like, did people really act like that? And you're like, yeah, they kind of did, didn't they? Yeah. Um, what I think about is is it goes back to my, my conceit that noir is not a genre. 
it's noir style. is a style. And this has its own and style. And the thing is, that's why this film can be accidentally noir, even if it wasn't the intention, because those are style choices. And yeah. every little element, I mean, the problem is you can choose to make a noir film, but really you're making a crime film that happens to have the style of noir. I agree. You know? And that's why so many like films get definition. that kind of style in there, too. So even this movie isn't accidentally, I think there's a lot of movies that have been recent that are accidental noirs because it's just an inspired style. Um, the film did have a 1999 sequel, uh, No One Returned, including Bridget Gregory was played by a different actress. Oh, if it doesn't have Linda, that hell with it. Yeah, yeah, I'm not really sure. Like, uh, I have no interest in seeing the second one. There's a morbid curiosity to it, but that's about it. Um, and then I, I also wanted to point out the the critical reception to Bridget because the film is oh, so about Roger her. Ebert loved it. Yes, there was a lot of people. There's one thing I film. don't like about her character's arc at the end of the film, and it's merely just a personal thing that didn't work for me as well. Um, the praise being about that she never goes good. I love that because there is the idea that like the female character, the strong female character in this film is going to learn that she's actually being bad and she's going to fall in oh, love for no. real. I love that. I think that's great that she doesn't turn back to, to good. I do wish she'd gotten caught. I don't oh, like the idea personal. that she that's your, yeah, yeah. I felt like she had, I felt like any other character, and again, this is an accidental noir because in a regular noir, if you're aiming for that, she'd get caught. <laughs> you know, she'd pay, she'd be doomed, but this being accidental noir, she gets away with it. And I kind of wish she'd gotten caught. There's a great reference to this movie on The Simpsons. If you catch it, it's uh, the episode of Reverend Lovejoy's uh, daughter coming back, and she married Bart Simpson and mm. all the boys around. Um, and at the end, Bart Simpson's like, "Well, you just apologized just to everybody. Shut you didn't really learn your lesson. Well, I learned that I can get boys to do whatever I want." Mm. And then another boy comes in and gives her, "Hey, you want to ride my bike? Yeah." Bart, can you finish this for me? Because I really want to. Yeah. yeah. And then Bart's <laughs> like, I'm going to clean these. She's going to be so impressed. <laughs> and she goes off. And they're like, that was the last seduction. That's one of my favorite episodes of The Simpsons. And I didn't think about it after watching the movie. Now I will be rewatching it tonight. Just, I, I learned I could get boys to do whatever I want. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> so what's your favorite film in, that inspired a oh, Simpsons before episode? We, <laughs> to catch on, the reason why I call this a post-noir is mm. because noirs... I think a little more, this is a new avenue. This is a new direction of noirs. It's a, not really a recycling, but it takes all the context of noirs. It's definitely after 80s and 70s, which I think is a capsulating of noir, but I think it's the different postmodern because she's definitely a postmodern femme fatale. Mm. And what I mean by post-noir is it's after the, all the other effects of like Angel Heart and Blade Runner and all that stuff that you have this very overly mod modernized she's beyond 80 she's the 90s kind of a woman yeah and i would that's that's why i regard this as a post-modern noir if you're kind of different that's fine if you have a different opinion about it please put down the comments but i think this is an element of post-noir noir you're not wrong there because technically speaking the femme fatale in a lot of these film noir in the classic ones the femme finale was usually working for somebody. She was usually involved with yeah. somebody. She's an individual. She was always in yeah. love with the, the main villain. She doesn't need you know? a guy. She's just bored. Yeah, this is a film where it's about her. The gender role mm -hmm. itself is that she's almost, she's not the femme fatale. She's just the, she's the, the male villain, but she happens to be a woman. Like, right. it's, it's not treated in a way where she has to be a femme fatale or has to fit that archetype. So. And I want to mention, I don't know if he, I, I worked at a factory for many years and one of my friends I, I like, I'm not going to name a name, but we always <laughs> talk movies. And I asked him why he was, I just brought it up one time and I was like, why are you single? And he goes, you know those women in noirs? Yeah, those, those women I really love and they're not good for me. <laughs> so even he knew. <laughs> so he's the mic. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, that's why I remain single. Yeah. Oh, well. <laughs> To each his own. Uh, I, I would still make the mistake of trying to uh, fall in love with Linda Fiorentino. Oh, and I would pay not, dearly it's so for hard it. not to fall in love with her. <laughs> it's so hard. So let us know your thoughts on The Last Seduction down below. Um, Linda Fiorentino is not making any new movies uh, oh, recently, shit, but uh, tell us, you know, maybe what are your favorite films of hers from the 90s? I, I really enjoyed her in Dogma, Men in Black. You know, she's she's pretty great as a main role or as a, a supporting role. Maybe I remember in high school, films. everybody in 1994, everybody's talking about this new woman on from Speed called Sandra Bullock, and we're all fun in love with Sandra Bullock, and I was like, Linda's kind of for me. <laughs> have you she heard about Linda? Linda. <laughs> yeah, Linda's for me. You, know, you can have Sandra. That's fine. She can have the college girl next door. But fair enough. Fair yeah. enough. Yeah, I, I think I was more of a Fiorentino as well, except for yeah. Bullock and Speed. I mean, I love, I love yes. Speed. But, yeah, yeah. Um, let us know your thoughts in the film down below. And while you're down there, please like and subscribe. They don't cost you a dime, but they help to support the channel, and we really do appreciate that. And you make sure you never that miss would, new episodes. That would take of the show. off Linda. Yeah, <laughs> she wants to make money. See.
We're not asking for money. We're asking for likes and subscribes, just like everyone else on YouTube. Uh, and please check out that, uh, well, actually, we're asking for money now. Check out the Patreon down below yes. as well. Um, yeah. For tiers as low as a dollar, you get access to Picks with Kyle and Nick. We just recently did a new, a new version of our show and tell where we bring in some of our cool items from the past. Um, you can check out our Patreon exclusive series, The Road to De Palma, where we and did we Raising did, Cane. We did Raising Cane. We'll probably do more. Um, We're doing right. another one this month. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we've got we've got a new episode of that every single month for you as well. Tears as low as a dollar for for free episodes. Well, additional episodes of the show, and then you can also get a tier where you can help us pick some of the films we're talking about in future episodes, which we really do appreciate. Thank you guys for joining us so much. You can find all my film reviews over at GoFilmReviews.com. You can find my podcast, the St. Paul Filmcast, anywhere you find podcasts. And after talking, I got actually, I did spill my coffee, so I'm going to have to clean He's that up. very much exuberant <laughs> about this film. <laughs>